Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Old Testament book of Joshua, and I'll be reading the last chapter, from the last chapter, Joshua 24, and I'll be reading verses 14 and 15. This is what it says. Then Joshua said to the people, now respect the Lord and serve him fully and sincerely. Throw away the gods that your ancestors worshiped on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. But if you don't want to serve the Lord, you must choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. You may serve the gods of your ancestors worshipped when they lived on the other side of the Euphrates River, or you may serve the gods of the Amorites who lived in this land. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us the strength, the power that we need to choose whom we serve. And may we not be unchanged through the worship that goes on. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I don't remember exactly when it was that I started paying attention to the dedications that are printed there in the front of a book. For the longest time, it seemed like the only dedication that I ever read would say something like, to my wife and perfect children, or to my husband and, and wonderful, wonderful children, and then the rest of the book. I do remember paying attention to the dedication in the front of one of Lyle Schaller's books. He dedicated the book to Shang, and this is what he said. He says, to Shang, who's mastered the essential, that he gets plenty of rest. He has a clear sense of his identity and he has the ability to ignore trifling diversions. It wasn't until near the end of the book that you figured out Shang was his dog and he had dedicated the book to his dog. Uh, one of my favorite book dedications is a dedication by Tobias Wolf. He said, to my stepfather who used to say what I don't know would fill a book. Well, here it is. <laughs> I like it that, you know, there is a, a, a place in, in books that, that now we, we set aside, that the, the dedication to the book is, is set aside for the front of the book. Well, Joshua, he's written a book. It's of his 30 battles there in the promised land. And his dedication isn't in the front of the book. His dedication in the, is in the very end of the book. And he says, and as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. He's dedicating his book to what he's uh, dedicated his life to. That Joshua was a teenager when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. When Pharaoh did let God's people go, they went out into the wilderness and it took them about two weeks to get to the promised land. They were looking over the river Jordan and, and Moses was saying, that is the land that God has promised to us. So each of the 12 dry, tribes, they, they chose a scout to go into the promised land. Joshua was the representative of his tribe. 
He was one of the 12 that went into the promised land first and they were to scout it out, to, to see what it was, was really like, what the, what the fruit was like, what the land was like, what the, the, the people were like. And after 40 days, they came back and they, they reported and they, they poured out grapes and they said, these are the grapes that are in the land that God's promised to us. And they were grapes like the people had never seen before. And they poured out figs and the figs were huge. And they said, these are the figs in the land that God has promised to us. And they, they poured out pomegranates. Well, the people had never seen pomegranates so big. And these are the pomegranates in the land that, that God has promised. And then they said, and there's one more thing. The people... They're giants, they're huge. They thought we were grasshoppers, we're so small. But there's no way in the world we can go in, in there and take the land that, that God has given us. They were so fearful that 10 of the 12 tribes said, let's just go ahead and kill Moses. We can go back to, to Egypt and, and maybe Pharaoh will let us be his slaves again. 10 of the 12 tribes turned against Moses and wanted to kill him. There were only two tribes that voted to stay with Moses. It was Joshua and his tribe and Caleb and his tribe. Well, God's anger began to boil and he was gonna smote them all. Now, I'm not real sure what smoting is, but I'm pretty sure it's not a good thing. God wanted to just smote them all. And that's when Moses stepped in on behalf of the people who wanted to kill him. And the Bible tells us that God changed his mind. Well, that doesn't happen a whole lot in the Bible. Doesn't happen a whole lot at all. But it lets you and me know the future is not set. That's why we pray. That's why we live. That's why we journey. Because God has invited us into to his future. That we might take part in it. And that's why we pray. Well, God changed his mind. He, did, he decided not to smote them all. Instead, he said, there will be a punishment. And that punishment is that you all will go back out into the wilderness. For one year, for every day that the scouts went into the promised land, you'll spend 40 years in the wilderness. And for 40 years, they followed God as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it was in those 40 years that, that the people went from being no people to being God's people. And at the end of those 40 years, the people stood at the same spot overlooking the River Jordan 40 years later to go into the promised land. But the only ones that were left from Egypt were Moses, Caleb, and Joshua. The people who were going into the foreign land, uh, into the, to the promised land, it was the children, the children of those who had left Egypt. And it was Joshua who would lead them into the promised land. And that's what the book is about. That's what the book is about, that he's dedicated his life to God from the very beginning. And he says, in, in, the, in the end, and as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And the book is about the 30 battles that, that Joshua has fought there in the promised land. We know that Joshua fought the battle. We've got songs about it. But before he ever fought the battle in the promised land, first, he had to fight the battle on the inside and that's what I want to talk about this morning. Fighting the battle on the inside. Chapter 1 of the book of Joshua, verse 6. God's talking to Joshua and he says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And then verse 7, he says, Be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Verse 18, he says, only be strong and courageous. Four times in the first 18 verses, God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. For a lot of people, these are their, their life verses that they go back to again and again and again. Four times in, in the first 18 verses, God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. Well, my hunch is 
The reason God tells him to be strong and courageous is because he wasn't. That before Joshua ever stepped on the field of battle, he had to fight that battle on the inside. That battle that we all fight. That battle against fear. Fear is the first emotion that any human ever speaks of in the Bible. God asked Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I hid for I was afraid. Fear is probably the most common emotion that any of us have, anywhere ever. And it's God who speaks to that battle on the inside again and again and again. Red Auerbach was the coach of the Boston Celtics a lot of years ago. And if you're not a sports person, the Boston Celtics, that's a basketball team. He was the coach and, and he was recruiting young players. And one year he had his eye on a, an incredibly good player that played for the Colorado, Colorado State. It was a young man named Billy Green. He was impressed with the way that he, he played basketball. And so he, he drafted him as, as his number one draft pick. And he, out of the choice of all the basketball players available that year, that was the one that he wanted. Well, Billy Green came to, to training camp and Red Auerbach stayed impressed with him. The coach thought he had chosen the, the, the winner, the one that would help them go to the next level, take the next step. He was excited about Billy Green until Billy Green unloaded a bombshell on him. Shortly before the season began, Billy Green went to him and, and asked him about his travel arrangements. That he said he was afraid to fly in an airplane and he'd like to take a train to all their games. Well, that's impossible in the time needed to from travel from one place to the other. Train couldn't get there. So he had to drop Billy Green from the team. Well, I'm not picking on Billy Green, and I'm certainly not picking on those who, who are afraid of flying. That fear is something common to us all. But it was fear that kept Billy Green, and it's fear that keeps all of us from receiving what we've been given. It was fear, fear of entering the promised land that kept God's people from receiving what they'd already been given. And it's fear, it's fear that keeps us hiding today. The good news is that Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross for you and for me to take the fear the shame, the sin, everything that would destroy us on himself and to kill it, to take away its power once and for all. And when he rose from the grave, he rose that the spirit of, of Jesus risen from the grave, the power that conquered death might live in you and me. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.9 says, God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. The spirit of power of the risen Christ that, that he gives you and me is a, is a power over fear. It's a power to be strong and courageous. It's a power not over other people, but power that fights the battle on the inside when we don't have the strength. A power. And it also says a spirit of power and love. It's perfect love that casts out all fear. That's what John tells us in 1 John. And it's that perfect love that, that Jesus has in, in you and me. It's not our strength to love, it's his strength to love. It's his power of his risen spirit. And it's that same strength that gives us the self-discipline to do what we can't do on our own. It's the power of the risen Christ alive in you and me that, well, fights the battle on the inside. 
Joshua knew what it was like to fight the battle on the inside and he knew that it depended on God. And for you and me, the good news is that Jesus Christ rose from the grave to give us just that power. Not a spirit of to be afraid, but a spirit of, of power and love and self-discipline. When Joshua fought the battle, that was the first battle, the battle on the inside. But he also had to fight the battle on the outside as well, that there really were giants there in the, the promised land. They really did have swords, they really did have shields, and they really did have spears. That the, the enemy was real. Suffering is real. Heartache, it's real. Grief and pain, it's real. I remember my first church. I served a little church down in LaGrange, Georgia. I was a senior in college. It was about 112 years ago. And I was preaching my very first sermon there in that little church. And <laughs> after I preached the first sermon, there was a woman sitting on the, the front row named Annie Clyde Yates. She was the matriarch of the church. And when I finished that first sermon, she turned loud enough for everybody to hear. She said, wasn't that the cutest sermon you ever heard? <laughs> and everybody kind of started laughing. And then she said, you know, after that sermon was over with, I didn't know whether to spank him or burp him. Well, it was real funny and we all just laughed and laughed a whole lot. <laughs> Some of the people there in that church were the most gracious, wonderful people that, that I've ever known. One of those people was my next door neighbor. His name was Obi Jeter. And Obi was, um, it, he, he was a proud owner of a, a Sunbeam milkshake maker. That what he had done was he, it, it, he would make milkshakes. He'd call me up every once in a while and say, hey preacher, I'm, ma I'm making milkshakes. Come on over and drink one with me. So I, I would go over to his house and we'd sip on milkshakes and he'd tell me stories. And he was just about the best storyteller I've ever known. He told me a story about when he was a child. He was in elementary school and the principal of his elementary school, whenever he, he, he saw anyone in the hall or wherever he saw him, he would say, what's your Bible verse? And each child had to, to have a, a Bible verse by memory that they pulled on. Well, Obi talked so fast and he stuttered so much, he said the only Bible verse that he could get out of his mouth was Jesus wept. And all the other kids in school knew that that was Obi's verse and you couldn't use that one because that one, <laughs> that one belonged to Obi. And that became Obi's life verse from the time he was a child. Jesus wept. And I got to thinking about it. You know, Obi was born in the early 1900s. He was a boy during World War I. He raised his family during the Great Depression and through World War II. Obi knew what suffering, pain, hardship, he knew what it was all about. And in that verse, Jesus wept. Obi knew that the one that, the one that feels our pain is the one that heals our pain. And his name is Jesus. And he doesn't just say, go out there and do the best you can that he's beside us, he's beneath us, he's around us, and he's inside of us. That it's the power of his Holy Spirit that gives strength that we don't have. He doesn't say, there is no such thing as suffering. He says, no, suffering is real. Put your fingers here in my hands and your hand in my side. Suffering is real, heartache is real, grief is real. But when it does its best, it's nothing to fear. For it's Jesus, it's Jesus who's there beside us, beneath us, around us, and inside of us. Galatians 2.20 says, excuse me, Hebrews 2.18 says, and now 
he can help those who are tempted because he himself suffered and was tempted. That it's Jesus, the one who feels our pain is the one who heals our pain. He knows what it is to be exactly where you are. Now, I don't know the battles that you're fighting. It might be a battle that, that started there in the doctor's office. Or it might be a battle at work or at school. It might be a battle in your very own family. Know that you're not alone. That Jesus has fought the good fight. And Jesus fought the good fight and, and rose from the grave. That his strength and his power might be in you and in me to give us the strength that we don't have. To fight the battle on the outside and to fight the battle on the inside. Joshua knew what that was like. But the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is Joshua knew what it was like to fight the battle on the inside, the battle on the outside, but he also trusted God for the results. That's why he dedicates his book. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That it's his strength. Years ago, the San Diego Chargers, for those of you who aren't sports fans, that's a football team. Their coach was, was looking for someone who might help the team. They needed a quarterback and they needed a quarterback badly. They were struggling. And so they got Dan Fouts. Well, Dan Fouts was a great quarterback and eventually a Hall of Famer. But in those first few years, he had a hard time of it. He struggled. And in one of those games, the team was two touchdowns behind. There was two minutes left. Coach took Dan Fouts out of the game and put in the backup quarterback, Bobby Douglas. Bobby Douglas strapped on his helmet, began to run out in the field. He was about halfway to the huddle when he turned around and came back and he said, Coach, we're two touchdowns behind and we have two minutes left. Do you want me to tie it or do you want me to win it? <laughs> well, well, that's confidence, isn't it? And what God calls us to is a confidence. And the word confidence means con in, in Latin, which is with, and fide, which means with faith. But it's not faith in ourselves that God calls us to. It's faith in him, trust in him. That what he's called us to, he's faithful and just. And he'll lead us to. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. And the son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. It was Jesus, Jesus, alive in you and alive in me. We can lean on him. We can trust him because it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And this life, it's not determined by our last breath that we did our best, that we have confidence in ourselves. It's not our last stand. Most often that the battles in this life are won and lost and our first breath in the morning. Then when we awaken, that's when life comes rushing at us. All the dreams and all the fears, all the aspirations come rushing in at us. And it's in that moment, that moment that, that we create a, a sacred space, a, a holy space and dedicate our lives for that day, that day. And we set aside a time, a place for the risen Christ in our hearts. Prayer has been called a disciplined dedication to paying attention. And it's at that, that first breath every morning that we, we dedicate our lives to Jesus who lives in his life inside you and me and we, we lean on him. We rely on him. We trust him. 
And we ask for his help to, to see his presence in every step, in every battle, in every day. This morning, it may be that you're fighting battles. Some of those battles may be the battle on the inside. Fear. You know it. Nobody needs to tell you. Hear the good news. Jesus has the strength that you need. Or it might be that battle on the outside, that there's something out there that, well, really does have swords and shields and spears. You're not alone. It's not dependent on, on you and your strength. It's the risen Christ that has strength that we don't have. This morning, I want to pray with you that you dedicate your life starting this day and in the days to come. That you'll dedicate your life to Jesus. Provide space, a time and a place for him every day. Pray with me. Jesus, trust is hard for us to come by because we know the giants out there. We know the fears. And Lord, we ask for your help to get to know you, to lean on you, rely on you, to trust in you. Breathe the power of your Holy Spirit on us gathered here that we might do exactly that. I do know that there are folks out there that are going through real struggles, real suffering. You've already defeated whatever it is that we fear. You've already given victory. And Lord, you breathe your life in us. Give us strength enough to be strong and courageous. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.